one myth that I have recently heard is that insect frass or insect poop will be an issue in your buds and decrease the quality of flower. That just simply isn't true. Beneficial insects will fail lab testing. Yeah, that is definitely a myth and misconception. It's more expensive for the grower than just using chemical application. I would challenge that notion. We've all heard of insect resistant pesticides or insects that are resistant to pesticides. And that can happen when we overuse chemicals. Beneficials are not good for outdoor farms. I would say that's not necessarily true. If I put out beneficials, I can't use any pest control products because I don't want to kill my beneficials. Well, that's not true. Hey everyone, it's Nate with Grower's House and Canna Cribs, and today we're making a really cool video on beneficial insects in cannabis gardens. We realize there's a lot of misinformation out there, so we want to educate growers on how to use them well, when to use them, and I brought along two extremely intelligent um, beneficial insect consultants. One from Bioworks, Tara, and one from Canna Cribs Consulting, Mike. Now, these two help people basically design programs and release beneficial insects in cannabis gardens from literally a million square feet down to a four by four tent. So let's get a little background from them. So Tara, tell us a little bit about your background. So I actually have a master's degree in environmental science and toxicology. Uh, it involved bugs and integrated pest management. From there, after I graduated, I moved over to cannabis and spent two years at two very large facilities. So one was 20 acres and one was 13 acres under glass. And I was the IPM supervisor for both. So I built and trained scouts and IPM programs, uh, ordered a ton of beneficials and put them out. So I'm very familiar. And I've spent the last few years in the controlled environment egg space where I've landed with Bioworks as their uh, technical Controlled Environment Agriculture Advisor. Mike, I know you and love you well, but let's tell the audience a little bit about your background. So I started growing cannabis in California when I got out of the military in 2010. Um, I bounced around from there and I landed in Arizona and I worked at a cultivation here. Didn't really like how they were doing things, so I went to school on the GI Bill, got my controlled ag degree. And from there, I actually pivoted into agriculture, worked in greenhouses, plant genetics labs for a little bit, and then you know, cotton and tomatoes gets kind of boring, so, you know, I uh, wanted to come back into cannabis, so I started to do consulting for cannabis for you guys. Well, why don't we go over the nine most common misconceptions and myths when it comes to biological control agents? So, one myth that I have recently heard is that uh, insect frass or insect poop will be an issue in your buds and decrease the quality of flower. That just simply isn't true. A lot of the beneficials that you put out won't have frass to that scale at all. Actually, the pests might, like thrips or loopers, which are not very common but can happen. You'll see that, but otherwise you wouldn't see their poop on your buds. I think what people maybe are confused about is the actual material that the beneficial insects come in that can actually get in your bud and be a problem. So there is a right way to apply that and make sure you're doing it strategically and not when your flowers have a bunch of sticky trichomes. So latent flower would not be recommended and there are other devices that you can use as opposed to broadcasting on top of your plants. Honestly, the honeydew from an aphid infestation or your pest problem is probably gonna be worse than any other frass that a beneficial will put out. So. It's always about the first problem, which is gonna be whatever is attacking your crop. Beneficial insects will fail lab testing. Yeah, that is definitely a myth and misconception. There's really nothing that lab testing is gonna look for. They're not gonna really look for arthropod shells. One of the things that you would definitely fail for would be if you had mold from honeydew or any sort of bacterial infection on the plant due to honeydew, plant tissue damage from a pest. It's not the beneficials that are going to create that issue for you. It's your initial pest problem. I 100% agree. I've never heard of beneficials causing your flower to fail. It's definitely going to be the pest issue or the pathogenist issue that you're going to fail on. If you want to talk about failing testing at the end of a cycle, over application of pesticides, that is a definite way that you can fail testing. So the biological control agents prevent you from having to over apply, which would make you pop hot for either pesticides or anything like that. So really it's a win-win situation if you're using bugs fighting your pest problems. So a myth I've heard pretty recently is that predatory mites can 
cause webbing in your buds, just like spider mite. I'm here to tell you that's just not true. If you see webbing, it's spider mite. What you might see is your beneficials walking across the webbing to find the spider mite, but if you have webbing in your bud, I would recommend cutting it out and cleaning up the areas around it because those spider mites are definitely gonna be through your crop at that stage. Right. That myth, you can feel rest easy. It's not your good bugs doing it. It's definitely your spider mites. One of the common myths that I hear is using biological control agents or BCAs or beneficial insects. It's more expensive for the grower than just using chemical application. I would challenge that notion because actually using beneficials as a preventative in your crop can help reduce pest issues down the line and actually reduce sprays that you need to apply because of those issues because you're using a preventative method. So one of the biggest things that, that can save you then is labor down the line. Labor is huge. The cost is astronomical. So if you're thinking about labor long term in your crop, if you're spraying, that person has to gear up, get everything ready, spray, and then probably spray again in a few days because the problem persists. So if you're thinking about personal protection equipment or PPE, you don't need any of that when you're applying BCAs. Like it's, they're completely safe to use and you should be reapplying them, but you definitely don't have to reapply at the same intervals that you might for an outbreak that you're spraying for. If we're talking about cost, you know, some people look at the price of BCAs and then the price of pesticides and think, well, why would I apply this expensive bug onto my crop when I could, you know, per square foot, this seems cheaper. Well, you're not thinking about all the extra costs to spray and the potential for product loss if you overspray. You can't really over apply beneficials because there's no max or min rate. There's recommended rates, but you can put out as many as you want really and your crop is still gonna be harvestable. If you overspray, you might damage your crop and think about the dollars that you will lose. You shouldn't be comparing the one-to-one -one of bugs versus sprays because the BCAs are preventative. And again, if you're preventing an issue, you're probably gonna save money in the long term versus if you're spraying and being reactionary, well, you might have already lost a bunch of your crop to an issue. So yeah, and another thing too is these biological control agents will actually attack and eat and kill your pests instead of kind of letting the pests get doused in a chemical and then slowly kind of adapting. Like we've all heard of insect resistant pesticides or insects that are resistant to pesticides. And that can happen when we overuse chemicals. So these biological control agents will give us the pest control we need by just actually going out and straight up attacking the bugs instead of putting them in a chemical slurry that they can adapt away from. One common myth is that people say they need to throw the beneficials once they've identified the bug or once they know what the infestation is or once they're already at a point of infestation infestation. That's really not the case with these biological control agents. We want to be using them as kind of a, a preventative shield, like a first barrier against those pests from even starting a population at all. So by identifying what's in your area and then putting out the right types of biological control agents for those, you kind of have a shield around your cultivation that other people around you may not have. So it deters the bugs from coming to you. And if they do come, they're immediately predated and they're not an issue. If we're talking about how well these bugs can find the pest issues. By the time you may see them, it's probably already an issue in your crop. Right. And just because you found them doesn't mean it hasn't been there for a while. So these BCAs can go and actually find those issues before you'll even find them. And that makes them truly preventative. So another myth that I often hear is if I put out beneficials, I can't use any pest control products because I don't want to kill my beneficials. Well, that's not true. What you should be thinking about is a holistic integrated pest management approach. So so putting out beneficial should be one prong in that approach that you're using to keep your plants safe. And that also includes good cultural, good physical, good sanitation practices that are all a part of this integrated pest management toolbox that you should be using in the first place. And a lot of people default to saying, well, I spray as a reaction to the issue. Once you're reacting, you're already losing the battle. So thinking about bugs, using them as part of a strategy, that's really what's going to get you further ahead in your cannabis production and creating the best product that you can sell and grow. Yeah, and in that vein, like I know you can and us on the Canna Cribs team as well can, we can develop IPM programs that utilize biological control agents as live bugs or insects, applications of certain things like probably fungicides, you know, applied at certain times and build out a whole cycles IPM program that will kind of cover all the bases while at the same time being modular enough for us to pivot to react to anything that may happen, but have a good base that would basically reduce any incidences 
of any pests getting above threshold. And so there's a link in the description so that if you guys are interested in getting a plan like that, we can definitely help you out. So one common myth that we hear a lot is, you know, I don't have a pest problem, so if I just release bugs, they're gonna die. That's kind of a loaded question with a pretty loaded answer. So certain strains of beneficials actually come with something called feeder mites. So they won't just all die as soon as there's nothing to eat because there's actually food for them in that sachet so that they can spread out through your cultivation and kind of persist as a population longer even if there's no food source. And it's, uh, it's pronounced sachet not sachin. Alternately, you're not really looking for your beneficials to always be chomping down on pests, because that usually means you got pests 24-7. The key about having these biological control agents in your garden is the fact that they're preventing these known pests in your area from ever gaining a foothold. Like a lot of people do preventative sprays, we see it as a better, cleaner version of doing a preventative spray. You're releasing these biological control agents to provide that preventative coverage, but they're alive. It's not an inert chemical that you can get any sort of resistance to. A myth I've heard is beneficials are not good for outdoor farms. I would say that's not necessarily true, but because these bugs have been reared and bred in controlled environments, you would really want to be strategic about your application outdoors and understanding the weather patterns of the area you're in. So make sure you're contacting your consultant, somebody that you trust to make sure that you are actually using your bugs correctly outside. Something to consider with outdoor releases of beneficials is the temperature and humidity. You can't control that outdoors, obviously. So there are some bugs that can only survive between say 70 and 90 or a humidity that's above 60% and it would be detrimental for you to be applying those bugs in an environment that isn't conducive to them surviving. Oh, and one thing people say too is like, you know, you're gonna put them out in an outdoor setting or in greenhouses and they're just gonna fly off. And that's not really how life works. They're gonna kind of look for the closest source of food. They're gonna look for the closest environment that would hold their food source. You know, these all have instincts. So they're gonna look for where the mites are gonna be. If it's a predator against aphids, they're gonna look where the aphids would be under the leaf surfaces. So generally what we see is they'll disperse themselves throughout the cultivation and you know, the population will dwindle, but they don't necessarily immediately leave the general area just because they can. So one of the other biggest misconceptions that we've also heard is we can only use BCAs or we won't use BCAs because we're so small or biological control agents really only make sense for large commercial guys at scale. And that's not really the case. Whether it's a small ecosystem or a large ecosystem, you always have predators and prey. So even in a small, say a tent setting, you can do weekly releases of biological control agents, especially if you have things like fungus gnats or if you have things like uh, root aphids. And and utilize these natural solutions without having to keep applying chemical onto your plants, possibly making a resistant strain of bug. So it doesn't really matter what scale you are, especially since nowadays you can get a lot of these biological control agents in small unit sizes, giant unit sizes, and you can apply them to the size garden you have. Any garden that has an IPM need can definitely just benefit from biological control agents. Absolutely, and I'd argue you can actually keep better data and you track have more control. over your, your yeah. bugs um, because you can actually see what's going on in a smaller facility and see how well the population is doing. You might be able to reduce the amount that you're putting out because you can see them being effective. So now let's talk about the top eight benefits of using BCAs in your cannabis garden. The first benefit that I often would say is a really great one is using BCAs involves zero pre-harvest interval. And what does that mean? It means that you can put them out the day you're about to harvest and you're not gonna have any issues with selling your flower and you're not gonna fail any tests, which we talked about in the next. On that same note, when you're thinking of pesticide applications, well, when you're putting out BCAs, there's no re-entry interval either, it's zero. You can put out bugs, and then you can walk your crop. Well, the second benefit that I can think of, um, you know, a lot of people talk about cost, and not a lot of people talk about the environmental cost. You know, when you apply a chemical, you're using water, you're using the chemical itself. A chemical factory had to make that chemical. When you're using a biological control agent, there's very, very low environmental impact. It's literally the packaging that they come in is gonna be like the largest impact. So if you want to kind of build a holistic IPM program with the lowest environmental impact, but the highest efficacy, that's usually where biological control agents come into play. The best bang for the buck when it comes to the big picture definitely comes from having live cultures do your work for you. So a third benefit that is honestly one of my favorite reasons to use them is these little guys are gonna do the work for you while you're Netflix and chilling. They've evolved and are adapted to literally find these pest issues. You can kind of set it and 
I wouldn't say forget it, but like kind of, you can set it and forget it because they're gonna go out and they're gonna do their job better than most chemicals can, right. especially in cannabis. So I would argue that having that mentality when you're using a little army of guys who can go out and eat that pest or lay eggs inside that aphid, which is kind of weird, but also awesome at the same pretty time. Pretty cool. Pretty cool, all while you're busy doing other things. And while environmental cost is important, you know, a lot of these times these are businesses, so the actual cost is important too. With BCAs, you're not gonna need application equipment. You're not gonna need personal protective equipment. You're not gonna need to get that equipment inspected, repaired, maintained. You're not gonna need to hire someone to do that. Your scout team is literally going to be your application team yep. at that point. So you reduce a lot of the overhead costs that would come with over applying chemicals by utilizing BCAs instead in a preventative manner. That bottom line is obviously so important for right. all growers so thinking about that in like a holistic approach like we've talked about integrated pest management you really want to consider all those ancillary costs associated with spray Absolutely. that you people often don't they just look at that price tag and it's really a short-sighted view we want to be preventative long term long term yeah, yeah. sustainable as long as we can basically Absolutely. for as low cost as we can this is a really big benefit that I think is worth having its own section. You are not exposing yourself or your workers to harmful chemicals, and that's incredibly important. When you think about sustainability and where you want your grow to be and a product that you're proud to sell to a consumer, why would you want to put something on your plant that could potentially harm someone if they walked in before the re-entry interval. I think it's really important to stress that BCAs have none of those concerns associated with them. You literally can put them out and it's safe to go into your crop. And of course, like we stated, one of the main benefits of these biological control agents is the pests can't build a resistance to them. They can have an evolutionary fight, which can take a couple thousand years, Just a couple sure. Thousand. But as long as you don't have that chemical resistance like we are having, we're seeing a lot with these newer over applied pesticides, yeah. it really ensures that we don't have to up the ante and use more stronger chemicals. We right. can just use these biological control agents that really were designed by nature yeah. and then just unleash them when we need them. Absolutely. When we think about like resistance and in agriculture, like pest resistance is huge. Yeah. Outside of cannabis, if you think about uh, white flies, like the Q-type, highly resistant to a lot of chemicals because the, of overuse, right? right? Banana fusariums. Yep, yep, exactly. So, and like, yeah, there's pathogens as well that are also resistant. Um, when we think about antibiotics in humans, that's something we have to face as, you know, society and humanity. We've over-prescribed antibiotics or overused them and now we're seeing resistant bacteria. So that same thought process should be ingratiated and internalized in your integrated pest management program when you're thinking about your plan. One thing that I really love about BCAs, there's a couple of them out there that you can release them once and they themselves will go and build their own population and think of how much money you can save just by a single release, spending maybe like what, 30, 40, 100 bucks on a single release and then seeing that beneficial in your garden, like it's honestly one of the best feelings where you just see them repopulating themselves. So at the end of the day, we just think you're using less power, you're using less equipment, you're using less labor. Nature's already done it for us, pretty dope attacking each other and making sure that populations steady out. So if we can pick and choose the right beneficial control agents to be in cultivations, then we get ahead of every problem that can naturally come up in a plant growing situation. Depending on the bug, there's a lot of different carriers, which is another term for material in which the bugs come in that can be found inside of your BCAs. The most common, vermiculite. Vermiculite is great because it is really good at regulating humidity, but some cannabis operations and quality assurance do not allow vermiculite in their facility and so we offer vermiculate free products for all of our packaging options that have it. The replacement for that is sawdust and then for some of the soil dwelling ones it's like a peat moss forest blend so it's just it looks like kind of like dirt basically. You get a tube of loose cucumerous or swirsky sometimes you'll see bran and bran mites but it's usually you know again um, sawdust based or vermiculite. I think now it's a really good time to talk about the different forms that BCAs come in. There are a lot, it can be overwhelming, I promise you. It's not, you just have to know what your issue is and know what your limitations are in terms of labor and cost. One really great packaging option is a mite sachet. This is cucumerous. Cucumerous is commonly used for thrips. The nice thing about sachets is you pull them apart and you can hang them on your 
plant mid canopy because the mites, when they leave, they tend to go up. If you put them too much at the top, you're gonna miss some of that foliage. So as the cucumeris continue to breed inside of here, they will start coming out of this hole and walking through your crop. These can last four to six weeks, depending on temperature and humidity. Yep. If you get a product in a tube, like the Stradiola left here is in a tube, when you're storing it, if you have to store any of them, we don't recommend storing bugs for too long. Store always on the side. If you store them upright like this, well, the mites tend to just walk up to the top. So when you do your dispersal, or when you're putting out your bugs, all of them will be found at the top and be on your first few sprinkles or plants and then the rest you're just putting out the carrier material it comes in. So what we recommend is when you are about to put out your bugs in these tubes, slowly rotate them like this so it integrates the mites into the carrier. Again, depending on your grow operation, your application methods might be different, but especially in veg, if you can, broadcasting on the top is one of the quickest and most effective way to get mites on top of your plants looking for the pest issue. If you're using soil dwelling, it really depends again on the structure or the setup of your grow. So broadcasting is a little trickier because you want them to be in the soil. So, you know, if you're on a trough system, you can walk and sprinkle a little bit in each of the pots or like every other pot because they will crawl, they will move. If you're on a table system and that doesn't seem feasible, I still recommend doing a broadcast. You can hit the outside pots if you have access to them, but it's all about getting as even as a distribution as possible with them. The Phytocellus persimilis is a specialist mite. And so these guys are amazing at destroying spider mite populations. The caveat for this specific BCA is that it only feeds on spider mites. So you do need to have spider mite in your crop for these to live and survive. That being said, if you see a small hotspot with really robust scouting, order persimilis and I bet dollars to donuts that in a few days or even a week later, you put out persimilis in that hotspot, you're gonna see a lot of dead spider mite and these guys will be running around. These are one of those hotspot cleanups. I would not be putting out preventative persimilis because right. that's not a thing. They're not gonna survive without their target item. They are really great at what they do. Especially in late flower, yeah. when you can't be applying any chemicals to yeah. your plants, yeah. you can definitely throw persimilis to save a crop. Yeah, everyone knows about aphids. In cannabis, you can get a few different species, but I think the most prolific ones tend to be root aphids and then cannabis aphids. These are blister packs, and inside these blister packs, there are aphidious species. It is a little tiny wasp that actually has really excellent hunting behaviors and will find colonies of aphids and lay their eggs inside the aphid to develop. The larva hatches and then consumes the aphid from within. Like the aphid will turn in a couple weeks into a a little mummy. Something really important to know, so these come in blisters, which I personally really enjoy because you get a more even distribution. Depending again on your space, they do have a good range. What is important to note about aphidious species, there's a few different ones. There's aphidious colmani, generally used for smaller aphid species, which the cannabis aphid is not. Aphidious ervi, which is used for larger species and can work on the cannabis aphid, but is a little more expensive. Aphidious matricariae, I actually think there's a lot of room for growth in that. In this one, I've heard anecdotally, it does a pretty good job against cannabis aphid. That's something to consider. What I will say, and like this is a big asterisk, although root aphids are an aphid because of their evolution, they might parasitize a root aphid happenstance they're not gonna target them, so don't put these out thinking they're gonna be your silver bullet for right. your root aphids. Unfortunately, that's just not the case. But for your foliar aphids, these guys are great. So Delosha, Coriaria, common name, rogue beetle, soil dwelling, beneficial, they fly. So these guys, I would a thousand percent to save time and energy, broadcast them, especially in your plants and veg, your mother, because they will find the soil on their own. They definitely prefer soil. Obviously they come in a soil media, but they are really great. They will eat your fungus, snat larva, shore fly larva, thrips, pupa, you name it. These guys will eat them and they'll keep reproducing in your crop. So often a single application can be enough. This is a great species for mom and prop areas yeah. because they are pretty persistent. Pretty low cost. I think the general recommended rate is like two per 10 square feet, but again, you can go higher or lower depending on what your needs are. So quick plug here. So all of these BCAs can be found on our Growers House Auto website. Everything is for order and we do have options for many of these different species. We have partnered with BioWorks because their BCA 
Bombay's are produced here in the US, so they're as close as we can get them. They are the highest quality and they ship overnight direct. So you're gonna get the freshest BCA's that have the highest live counts. So you can make sure what you're putting on your plants is actually what you expect to be on your plants. And one of the great things about us partnering with Bioworks is that we get to utilize lovely people like Tara to help us make our IPM programs and suggest the right BCA for you for what you need. Thanks so much, Mike. It's been an honor working with you guys today and I hope everyone's a little more comfortable with BCAs. Now that you see how uh, nice and cool both of us are, why don't you check out Grow's House Auto and pick up some BCAs from us.